Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to spend the next little bit of time sharing a story, a, a bit of research I was lucky enough to, to play a role in that combined shipwrecks, beer and yeast. Certainly three things I never thought I'd be giving a talk on. Um, I'll, I'll let you guess which one is the, the odd one out of, the, out of those three for me. And so this project starts off essentially in the late 1700s. So it's been 220 odd years in the making. Uh, the colony at Port Jackson was less than a decade old and entrepreneurs in India, um, sort of spin-offs of the British East India Company, decided they'd try and make their fortune trading with the new colony. One of those private trading houses was uh, Campbell and Clark with Robert Campbell here. They decided they would take alcohol. That was their primary production. Campbell and Clark were into brewing and fermenting distilling rum in India and also importing a lot of alcoholic beverages such as beer and wine and other spirits out of Europe. That they would ply their trade with the new colony. So they sourced a second-hand ship, sort of doing it on the cheap. Second-hand ship, an old rice freighter called the Began Shore, rebadged at the Sydney Cove in honour of the new colony filled it up with alcohol. There were 7,000 gallons of spirits on this boat, as well as a few other little bits and pieces like porcelain and leather. And they thought, okay, we've got this boat full of alcohol. We'll simply sail it from the Bay of Bengal and Calcutta down around Van Diemen's Land because they didn't know Bass Strait was there and we'll wind up in Port Jackson, sell our gear and make a lot of money. A little bit short-sighted and would probably make occupational health and safety cry nowadays. Um, the problem was the Sydney Cove was never designed for the open ocean. These rice freighters were only designed for coastal voyages. So as soon as they got out of the Indian Ocean, it immediately began to leak. So they were manning the bilge pumps. Uh, before they'd even hit Tasmania, five guys had already died from exhaustion, from pumping all the time for, for sort of five days straight. Once they come up the east coast of Tasmania, they hit another storm. That was the storm that broke the Sydney Cove's back, essentially. Uh, it began taking on more water than they could pump out, so the captain, Guy Hamilton, decided they would beach, they intentionally beach and, and wreck the ship on this tiny little speck of an island here, just south of Cape Barren Island, off the northeast coast of Tasmania. So that's where they uh, wrecked the ship in the end. So just south of this small island that they named Preservation Island, and just north of Rum Island. So Preservation Island is where they were able to salvage most of the goods and crew to because they'd wrecked the ship intentionally on a sandbank. They had time to get a lot of the goods off. Rum Island was where they put all the rum. And that was so the crew couldn't drink all the rum and drink their profits if they were ever able to get the goods to Port Jackson. So no one knew they were there. They had no hope of anyone actually finding them. Ships didn't come by all that often. So in the end, amazingly, and this is a whole other tale that I won't get into, but they sent 17 guys off in a longboat. A longboat, one of those rowboats sent them off in a long boat for Port Jackson. So they actually rowed across Bass Strait. They crashed on a beach, 90 mile beach in Gippsland and ended up walking 600 kilometers to Port Jackson. This is through scrub white men had never seen before. Three of them ended up making it, the 17, and they were able to sound the alarm. They sent ships down to rescue the people, that, the crew and that, that, that had survived and got all the goods, most of the goods that they could rescue up to Port Jackson. Enough of that though, we get into the archeology. span so the Sydney Cove laid undisturbed for a couple of hundred years at that point, um, covered up with sand, things like that. In the late 70s it was rediscovered and then they sent a, uh, Tasm Tasmanian Parks and Wildlife sent an archaeology crew down there in the early 90s. And what they found was that the ship was very, very well conserved and especially the organics. It was a unique environment for, for preserving organic material. Not just the, the hull timbers that you can see here, this is all the, the hull timbers, you know, very, very well preserved but also other organic matter, like rope. So these are all artifacts off the ship, rope. Leather for shoes, they had leather shoes on board. And even things like peppercorns and tobacco leaves. So all these organic material was, was preserved due to the combination of the ship being buried under sand and sea grass, the cold water, lack of oxygen. Very unique shipwreck. Now given all the alcohol that was on board, it wasn't surprising that they pulled up lots and lots of fragments of bottles. But what's absolutely amazing is that they pulled up a couple of dozen where the bottles were actually intact. And not just the bottle that was intact, they still had corks, they still had red wax seals that Campbell and Clark had put on the bottles to trademark them as their own because they just sort of sourced alcohol wherever they could a lot of the time. 
and they had their contents intact. So we had all of these sort of 200 year old fermented beverages come up off the ship. And so they sat in the collection for 20 odd years at the museum until a curator, David Thorogood, started up, a new, a new curator, and he sort of had the idea that, well, microbes have been used to ferment these beverages. Can we actually isolate those microbes? Can we bring them back to life after a couple hundred years? And so that's because what we see, what microbes we can see, and, and, and when we get into yeast, is that beer and wine, as well as most other alcoholic beverages like sake and also bread baking, all rely on a small unicellular relative of mushrooms whose Latin name is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But you may know it as baker's yeast or brewer's yeast. And out of the hundreds of species of yeast, given its relationship with humans for so many thousands of years, it's actually also just termed yeast. So even though there are so many other yeasts, this one's given pride a place of being called yeast. And it is very efficient at turning sugar into alcohol and also carbon dioxide for making bread. And so David thought, well, why can't we try and isolate some yeast? So we got in touch with us at the AWRI. We've been fortunate here on Wake Campus to, through the, our association with the wine industry, which is heavily reliant on yeast, to build up the leading yeast group in Australia. And so he came to us and, and thought, well, maybe we can turn our, turn our skills towards beer and, and old beer at that. Um, so we thought, well, maybe, maybe we can find a, a rule-breaking yeast that's actually been able to survive for, for a couple of hundred years down at the bottom of the ocean. So our microbiologist, Simon Dillon, went to work on this problem, uh, essentially taking really small samples of these beers. They're quite precious, so little 0.1 mil samples, inoculating them into different sort of liquid growth media, these nutrient broths that yeast often like to grow into. So we had 40 different samples from the shipwreck of wine, beer, other spirits as well as some samples from another shipwreck, the Asterope, that, that wrecked 100 years later. And for the most part, after growing the samples in the, the nutrient broth, it looked as it was when we started. Co completely clear, nothing growing. And we kissed a lot of frogs in this experiment, hundreds of samples that Simon went through, until we actually got a couple where we could see yeast growing. So they turned cloudy, got the bubbles, they were fermenting away. So two samples out of the hundreds that we tried. These two both happen to come from beer, both happen to come from the Sydney Cove. And in the end, both come from the same original bottle of beer that was found. Uh, they were decanted into two separate containers 20 years ago, as most of the other bottles were, because their cork started to fail once they were brought up off the bottom. And it turns out that we had both samples that had been stored separately, um, both grow yeast. But what sort of yeast? Yeast are hard to tell. You can't, often can't just tell what they are by looking at them. Uh, this is a microscope picture that Simon took. We can sort of take guesses of what's there. You know, they just sort of look like bubbles often. You, know, you sort of try and tell which, which bubbles are which. These are probably Saccharomyces, we thought, under the microscope. So that, that group of yeasts that make beer, wine, uh, bread. But they weren't alone. At least one other type in there, these sort of more oblong ones, which are called Britannomyces, or Brett. Also found in beer and wine. In modern fermentations, they're considered a contaminant for the most part, except in a specific type of beer called Lambic Ales out of Belgium. But certainly in the type of brewing they were doing back, you know, when the beers were made, uh, they, were, they were more sort of open bats and anything that floated in, floated in. And so you wouldn't be surprised to find Britannomyces. But we wanted to find more information. You know, under the microscope it's not all that accurate. So we actually turned to something else we, we've got quite a good reputation for now, and that's genomics, and particularly yeast genomics. We're a world leader in this as well. And so here you take your unknown yeast, smash it up, get the DNA out, put it through one of these sequencing machines. The sequencing machine gives you the DNA, but in all these sort of little chunks, we've been able to build up databases of what yeast genomes should look like. And so you can put this data, this sequence data, up against your database. It will tell you what the species is, what the type it is, and more importantly, you can also pop it on a family tree, and we've got these family trees of yeast now. And by looking at you know, who it's close to on the family tree, you can often say what industry it's involved in, what sort of yeast it was, that was used. And so, what are the shipwreck yeasts? So I'll just remind you, this is our Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the one that's used in baking wine, and I've got here ale rather than beer, and I'll get to that in a minute. So specifically ale, um, two blue chromosomes. Our shipwreck Saccharomyces had those two blue chromosomes, so it was at least partly Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We could put this on a family tree, and sure enough, out of all the different options that we've got for the type of Saccharomyces, it was a beer strain. 
Now I'll put this up. This is the Lager yeast. It's slightly different from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It still has those blue chromosomes, but it's also got a pair of red ones. So Lager strains are actually a hybrid. They're two yeasts in one. Two different yeasts have come together, fused and made a Lager yeast. Now I say this because our shipwreck yeast was actually two yeasts in one as well. It was a hybrid yeast. It was different to Lager strains. It's a different species that's donated these chromosomes, a species called Saccharomyces uvarum. Nevertheless, it was a hybrid, one that you don't see in modern brewing. And in fact, out of all the yeast genomes that we've sequenced, we haven't seen a, a hybrid that exactly matches this strain. So at this point, it's unique to, to yeast genomes. What of our bread? Out of our two options, wine, beer contamination, there are other sorts of bread as well. So out of all those options, when you put that genome on a family tree, it was also a beer, beer yeast. Um, matches strains that are used in those Lambic Gales in Belgium. I should say that the one that this, the beer strains that this match are also um, Trappist Ales out of Belgium. So it's looks like we've got two beer yeast genomically, both with European origins, um, which was very exciting when we consider where our beer is likely to have come from. So I'll finish up, my time's up, I'll finish up very quickly. Can our yeast make beer? That's a question most people ask. And the short answer is, yes it can. So we've had Simon Dillon, who was a microbiologist, who's a keen home brewer. David from the Queen Vic Museum, who, who donated uh, the beer samples to us. And uh, another uh, really expert home brewer, Michael Roach, who's in the audience, who's also a brewer, but a bioinformatician at the AWRI on top of that, have all made beer, makes very good beer, Got a bottle here, <laughs> just to help me along. <laughs> Brews both as a nail yeast and a lager yeast, so having that second pair of chromosomes also seems to give it some lager <coughs> uh, options. The guys at the museum have called theirs preservation ale after the after the uh, after the island. So yes, makes yeast, uh, makes beer, makes very good beer. So we've actually had two yeasts that we've pulled out of these old beers, both look like beer yeast from a genomics point of view, but also more importantly, act like beer yeast. So I'm going to finish up with an acknowledgement slide just to thank all the many people that have been involved in the project. Um, it's very rewarding in science to be able to work on something where you combine such disparate fields as yeast genomics, microbiology, you know, history and deep sea archaeology, things that I'd never thought I'd be in touch with um, over the years. Even better when at the end you get out pretty good beer. <laughs> so I'll leave it with that and say thank you all. <laughs>